This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. So, having gone through and looked at the world of, if you like, basic group accounts with the parent, a subsidiary, an associate, and also touched upon the world of joint arrangements, we're now going to move on to complex groups. Uh, complex group sounds complex, doesn't it? Uh, all I would say is it's better to think of it as a, as a complex group structure as opposed to anything ridiculously hard that is going to, 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 to be thrown at you. Okay. Uh, so what do we mean by complex groups? Uh, well, there are two types of complex group structures that we could be encountered with. A vertical complex group structure and a D-shaped complex group structure. So let's go through and look at them in isolation and what we have with regards to the group structure. So if we look at the vertical group structure first, imagine we have a company X, which will ultimately be the parent, and X has control over Y, the, the subsidiary. So there's, there's nothing new within there. We, we've looked at all of that before. However, now what becomes complex is that instead of the parent having the investment in the sub, what also now happens is that that sub, so Y, has an investment in another entity Z, and that investment in the other entity Z gives Y control. So effectively what we have is we have a parent that controls a subsidiary, and then the subsidiary has control of its own subsidiary. So effectively what we have is a parent, a sub, and a sub-subsidiary, because if the parent controls the sub, it can put the directors in the subsidiary, and it can tell those directors what to do. And therefore, those directors are under the control of the parent. And therefore, they also have control of the sub-subsidiary. So they can put the directors in the sub-subsidiary. And which directors will they put in? The ones that the parent tells them to, because the parent has control over the sub. Okay. So it's all about a vertical group structure, whereby we have a parent that controls the sub, and the sub controls the sub-sub. In which case, therefore, the parent also controls the sub subsidiary. So we have a nice big parent sub sub subgroup. Okay, makes sense. Okay, uh, we'll look at the issues surrounding it in a moment. With a D-shaped group, uh, what we've got there is a company A, which again has control of company B. Uh, and what we're then going to have is an investment in another company C. But instead of just B having the investment in C, what will also happen is that A will also have some form of investment in C. So it's not just the sub that owns part of C, it's also the parent that owns part of C. And by combining the ownership that A has in C, and by combining the ownership that B has in C, then that should give us control over C, so that again, we have a parent, a sub, a sub-sub, and because the parent owns shares in the sub subsidiary, we have a D shaped group. Okay, you can see the D there in the air. Okay, so you need to spot whether you have a vertical complex group or a D shaped complex group structure. Yeah, it, it should hopefully be quite easy to spot when we start working through the examples later. The issues, however, that we need to think about are fourfold. Uh, first one is looking at the percentage ownership. So we'll just focus it thinking about a vertical group structure first because we know what the parent owns in the sub and if we know what the parent owns in the sub we know the non-controlling interest uh, but what about when the parent owns shares in the sub the sub owns shares in the sub sub we know what the sub owns of the sub sub but, but what percentage ownership does, does the parent own so we'll need to work out the parent's percentage ownership so that we can then work out the non-controlling interest ownership within the sub subsidiary okay uh, we also need to look at the acquisition date so the acquisition date of the sub subsidiary because that's going to be important isn't it because we need to work out the net asset at the date of acquisition so we need to identify when the sub subsidiary became part of our group okay so we'll need to pay a bit of attention to the acquisition date we have a sub subsidiary so we need to calculate the goodwill we know what the standard goodwill calculation is we look at the fair value of the consideration, we add on the non-controlling interest, and then we deduct the net asset to acquisition. Well, is there any changes to that calculation that we need to make, given that we are looking at the sub-subsidiary and not the sub? 
Uh, and then last but by no means least, we need to look at the non-controlling interest, don't we? Because we know the non-controlling interest in the sub, so it's the non-controlling interest at acquisition, uh, plus the non-controlling interest share of the post-acquisition movement of the net assets of the subsidiary. We'll still use the same calculation for the non-controlling interest in the sub-subsidiary, but do we need to make any adjustments to it? So that there's four things on top of the basics that you already understand. So let's have a look at the first of our complex group structures, which is looking at our vertical group structure. Uh, the first bit that we're going to go through and look at is ensuring that we can calculate the percentage ownerships. So here, if you have a look at your notes, what you've got there is you've got your vertical group structure, whereby you have X at the top uh, and Y underneath, and X controls Y, doesn't it? Okay, so what you've got there, nice and simple, X is the parent, isn't it? Uh, y is the subsidiary, okay? Uh, so therefore, the, the non-controlling interest that you have there, Is equal to 20% so you would just consolidate that subsidiary as is normal okay uh, the issue then comes doesn't it in that P controls S so X controls Y and Y also controls Z doesn't it so Z is a subsidiary of Y but that makes it a sub subsidiary of the parent isn't it okay because X can control Y and if it controls Y it will then put its directors in Y and it can tell those directors what to do when it controls Z. Okay, so you have a parent, a sub and a sub subsidiary. Okay, we spoke about that earlier, didn't we, in terms of the introduction. The issue that we've got now is to work out the, the non-controlling interest, isn't it? And the, the, the percentage ownership. So what you've got there is that if the parent owns 80% of the sub and the sub in turn owns 70% of the sub sub, then all you do is you just multiply down the spine. Okay, because what the parent owns is 80% of 70, isn't it? Yeah, so that's 80% multiplied by 70%, which gives you 56%. So if we own 56%, then the non-controlling interest must own the remaining 44%. And what we do there is we use those words, effective level of control and effective level of non-controlling interest. So we've now got an NCI of 44% in the sub-subsidiary and the parents effectively own 56% of that sub-subsidiary. So that's important to kick things off when you're looking at the percentage ownerships. What we could also go through and look at as well is looking at the importance, is it of the acquisition date? So you have the X, which we've said is a parent. Uh, y is the sub. Z is the sub sub. So we've just changed it up ever so slightly just to give you a bit more, if you like, practice. Okay. Uh, because you've got 80% ownership. So again, uh, the non controlling interest is 20%, isn't it, in the sub. Uh, in the sub sub, 80% uh, of 60, that's 48, isn't it? Okay, so Z is a 48% subsidiary. Don't start thinking that it is an associate. Yeah, we do have control. We have the power to direct the activities. We're not worried about the, the percentages. We're worried about do you have the power to direct the activities? And we do, don't we? Because P, can direct the activities in S because it can appoint the directors and it will therefore as well be able to direct the activities of SS because S has control of SS, doesn't it? So what we've got there is if we have a 40% ownership, then the effective non-controlling interest is 52%. So, so just be careful there. However, the focus that you've got here it is on the acquisition date, isn't it? Because what you can see there is that the sub and the sub sub brought themselves together on the 1st of April X0, which is before the sub became part of our group. So when we're looking at calculating the goodwill, 
we need to work out the net asset to acquisition. And this is where it is important, isn't it? Because the sub and the sub sub became part of the X group when on this date there, the 1st of January 20 X1. Yes, the sub sub became part of S's group at an earlier date, the 1st of April X0. But for the P group or the X group, as we have here, S and SS became members of our group on the 1st of January X1. So we can essentially ignore that acquisition date when it comes to looking at the net assets at acquisition of SS. You need to put in the net asset to acquisition on the 1st of January X1. So the rules are there at the bottom is if the sub and the sub sub combine together at an earlier date, then we ignore that earlier date, don't we? So that's the second thing to go through and think about. The importance of the acquisition date, as well as the first bit, being able to work out the percentages in terms of effective control and effective non-controlling interest. So let's have a look at the example, Matty, and look at how that brings together accounting for a vertical complex group with a group statement of profit or loss because the only issue that you have is that you need to go through and look at the non-controlling interest and ensure that you apply the correct non-controlling interest percentage to the correct sub or sub subsidiary okay <laughs> so it says as that does there the sub and the sub sub are consolidated as normal but the non-controlling interest needs to be calculated in the sub sub based upon the effective nci percentage so using the correct one the sub sub and the correct for the sub uh, so here it wants us to produce the summarized matty group statements of profit or loss so matty must be the parent again it wants it there is it for the year end the 31st of december x5 uh, so you've got two other entities that are involved is it luke and ben again i draw your attention to the fact that there is investment income if you remember on the investment income we need to remove the investment income don't we before we consolidate it uh, and Matty has 80% of Luke uh, so is that therefore a 20% NCI and also as well 75% of Ben so Luke is the sub Ben is the sub sub because we have control and control uh, 80% of 75 is at 60. So therefore, the non-controlling interest should be there. Is it as 40? So if I multiply 80%, so 0 0.8 by 0 0.75 on my calculator, you should get 60. So that's the effective level of control. So the effective NCI is there as 40, isn't it? Uh, again, I draw your attention here. Uh, it says Luke and Ben have declared and paid dividends during the year of 25 and 20,000 respectively. So Luke's dividend, if we go through that and take 80% of that, so that will be Matty's share, won't it? Because Luke is the sub. So the sub has paid a dividend of 25,000. Matty will have recorded its share. And 80% of 25 is 20, so we can remove that 20 there, can't we? Uh, ben paid a dividend, was it there, of 20,000? Well, if that's the case, Luke will have recorded its share, won't they? And Luke's share is 75% because that's how much Luke owns of Ben, isn't it? And 75% of 20 gives me there, is that as 15, isn't it? Okay, uh, so I'm going to remove that 15 when it comes to the consolidation, isn't it? Okay, so let's go through uh, and work it through step by step. Uh, we can go through there and look at the group statement of profit or loss. Uh, there's no mid-year acquisition, there are any nonsense like that. Uh, so what we've got there firstly is to look, is it at our operating profit? We can add the three together. Is it of 224, 136, and 98? I think that gives me 458. Uh, you can then go through. That will give you, again, as well, PBT, because there's 
There's nothing else to adjust for, is there? Uh, you can then go through there and take your tax and add them across 30 plus 32 plus 30. No, sorry, plus 20, not 30. So does that give me 82? Because remember, I've ignored all the, the investment income, haven't I? Intragroup. So that goes through and gives me a profit for the year. Is that there of 376? And then what we need to be able to do is we need to be able to split that into the amounts that are attributable to the parent and the non controlling interest. So, as always, the amounts attributable to the parent are a balancing figure, uh, and the non controlling interest we will need to go through there and calculate that, won't we? So I'll just do that in a separate working. Uh, the non-controlling interest in the sub was 20%, wasn't it? Be careful because the profits are 112, aren't they? We need to remove. Oh, careful. That 15, which is the dividend that was received by the sub from the sub sub. And if you tap that into your calculator, I think you get 19.4. In the sub subsidiary, uh, the effective level of control was 60. The effective NCI was 40. And the profits were 78, weren't they? 40% uh, of 78. Gives me 31.2. Does that then give me NCI in total of 50.6? Uh, 50.6 is my NCI. Uh, if I deduct that from the 376, does that give me 325.4? Okay, it's as simple as that. Uh, if you're going through and looking at this within your exam uh, and a or an objective test question, then it's likely to go through there and ask you to work out what the non-controlling interest is, I would have thought, or maybe give you a profit for the year figure and get you to work out the amount attributable to the parent by calculating the NCI to then work out the, the parent figure. So just to give you an idea of what you could potentially expect, but you know, anything's possible, isn't it, within the real exam. Uh, work through that example again. Hopefully you get a similar question too. It was nice and straightforward, wasn't it? Uh, and then we'll go through in the next lecture and start looking at things such as goodwill and NCI on the SFP. See you in a little bit.